exploiting underdog trends. That's what we're going to talk about today on Stealing Bananas and Ben Gretsch. You can find the Stealing Signals newsletter at bengretsch.substack.com. With me, as always, is Sean Siegel, who has been slaving away over our road of this, writing a ton of incredible content lately. A lot of it around uh, how to approach underdog best ball drafts and um, the unique challenges that they present. And then, Sean, I recently drove down to Oregon and entered a bunch of slow drafts for, for myself and have gotten an opportunity to be doing some of my own drafting. Usually I've been drafting with you or ship chasing guys on streams. I didn't know how the rules all worked for somebody who lives in a state where I can't play underdog in my own state. Turns out that I can do it as long as I enter these contests in a different state. So did a little commuting last uh, weekend and um, have been doing a bunch of drafts and have, you know, some of my less developed thoughts than your incredible workshop pieces that have like a ton of data and, and evidence behind them. But we've been talking a lot about underdog these last couple of days. Um, and yeah, we're going to talk about it on the show. It's going to be a lot of fun too, Ben. I appreciate you mentioning those pieces. The underdog workshop is one of our favorite you know, areas of content. And we'll have more of that this year than ever before. The underdog advanced rate explorer is really like six or seven tools in one. The underdog roster construction explorer, Ben, it just helps us figure out what has worked. And then you can combine that with thoughts on ADP, how ADP is moving. We can see what history tells us and then work through what we should do in 2023 as a response. And then the other thing that I have been doing that has been so much fun is drafting with our great friend, Peter Overset on the best ball banana stand. And then those drafts are wide receiver avalanche drafts. So they create another layer of Difficulty, some additional hurdles that you have to be able to get over to build a good team. We did a latent three build at both QB and tight end in the last show. I'll have that written up. But just before the show started, you released a look at your early tactics for 2023. We're going to go through a lot of that today. And I've got to say, I'm pretty excited for you to have made that drive to draft all of these teams. It's a lot of fun to get a lot of teams in early, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I guess it's still early. It's funny I, because I talked to you and, and Pat and Pete who are hundreds of drafts in and so many people that are have been drafting since like February. I feel like I'm way behind. Most of our listeners probably think that's ridiculous, but I'm drafting third teams right now and I feel like I'm massively behind because it's June and I'm just drafting my first, you know, however many teams um, on my own. I mean, we've done a lot of joint drafts and those things, but... For most people, yeah, it's still early, I guess. Um, and, and really, when you think about ADP and what's going to happen until August, we're still talking in, in terms of there's going to be shifts. And there's already been some, but there haven't been massive ones yet, necessarily. There's going to be some pretty big ones. There's going to be, you know, the unfortunate reality of some offseason injuries that end up happening usually in July and August when the training camp picks up. There, there typically is a couple. Um, there are going to be some running back still landing in some spots. We obviously saw Dalvin cook released and that's going to shake some things up. And now we're going to see him probably land somewhere. And, you know, Kareem Hunt and Leonard Fournette and Ezekiel Elliott and all these guys are still floating. Um, expectation is they're going to probably be on rosters and then likely impact ADPs. Uh, one of the teams that I did a projection for recently that I thought made sense for one of them to land on, I don't know who, but it was Tampa Bay. And like Rashad White's been a tough one to pick. He's a little bit of an older prospect. His rookie year wasn't very efficient. And he's being priced sort of affordably if you realize that like he could get a lot of work. There's not a lot of guys behind him on this depth chart. But then I think if one of those guys lands there, he's the kind of profile that his price will actually get a lot cheaper, frankly, if somebody does like a cream hunt lands there or something. We'll see if something like that happens. But those types of shakeups are coming. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot still to happen, but we've been talking through it. And and as I've done these original, these few first few drafts, I mean, you mentioned the wide receiver avalanche with the drafts you've been doing with Pete. And we, you know, th that's a fun term that talks about how, you know, a lot of the wide receivers going really high. 
and then it happens a lot on, on you know on Pete's streams uh, uh, especially and so you get that little added element there but it is true across underdog generally relative to any of the other sites if you go to do a best ball draft at DraftKings or at FPC or in other places the wide receivers go higher at underdog and I could argue that it's because of a, a sharpness of the um clientele at underdog I don't know. I mean, that's that'd be one case to be made. I think it's sharper ADP. Certainly, we're we're under, we're wide receiver fans around here, um, but it does present some interesting challenges. And yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of where we're going to start today. That's something that I mentioned in my recent write up that I've noticed right away. You have the really high QB ADPs this year. You have got you know QBs going as high as the second round. They're starting to slide a little bit. Maybe the top ones are going in the third round more frequently now. But then you also have even behind the top names, the rest of the QBs are going so high. I think that second wave, as we've talked about in past years, kind of get pulled up by the, the the height of the first group of QBs ADPs. And I think that second wave is really where it gets tricky. Because like if you're going to pay up for Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts, those guys have elite ceilings. When you start to pay up for guys that maybe just belong in the wide receiver window and can't really score in a differentiating way at quarterback anyway, then it starts to get pretty tricky, but quarterbacks going higher than ever um, or not than ever, but then in the last several seasons, wide receivers also going incredibly high. And so you have these decisions to make in the early parts of round where if you are of drafts, where if you do want to take a quarterback, if you do want to take some early running back depth, if you want to take an elite tight end, I think there's a lot of teams where you can you can get done drafting them and feel like, okay, I got a good quarterback here. I got a good tight end. I got a couple good running backs and built up my running back depth later. And, you know, it feels like a good team, but then when you really dig into it, I think what people are going to find during the season is there's just not enough receivers. You know, maybe you only got two or three receivers before that wide receiver window ran out. And it is the type of atmosphere, especially on underdog, where by the eighth round sometimes you can't get – a receiver with a a legit upside profile. It used to be, you know, we last year wide receiver window, we talked about stretching sort of through Garrett Wilson throughout most of draft season. He's like an 11th round pick last year. Now it's, you know, the ninth round, you can't get a Garrett Wilson 2022 pick usually. Um, So it's a different atmosphere. And it means you have to probably take fewer detours in the early parts of drafts. Or if you don't, you know, you're going to feel comfortable with that QB, that tight end in the early ranges, but you're probably not going to have the depth at receiver that you think you do, or you're not going to be able to compete um, in the way that that roster feels safe and comfortable and, and tucks you in at night. And there are so many things to unpack there, but to give a little bit of a sense of what you're actually looking at with some of those ADPs, you mentioned the fourth round as one of the potential not exactly tier breaks, but a, a spot to look at. 26 wide receivers through round four, only 14 running backs. You get into round eight, another area that you mentioned, and the round eight wide receivers are Rashad Bateman, Elijah Moore, Zay Flowers, Michael Thomas, and Cortland Sutton. So you're talking about guys who are coming off of some type of injury or disappointing season, or in the case of Zay Flowers, a rookie in a low-volume passing offense where they now have quite a few receivers. So the huge red flags that are attached to round eight receivers, and it just gets worse from there as you go through. That gets us back to this question of how do we want to build out and how do we make a best ball roster actually work to score at the starting lineup positions? You mentioned that these drafts are going to be more wide receiver heavy than in some of the other formats. And that can be pretty counterintuitive when you think about the fact that underdog is half PPR. And so there are going to be some advantages, especially for some of the run heavy running backs. And Nick Chubb is going off the board at running back six, right in the middle of the second round. He's someone who in theory benefits. And yet one of the articles I'll have coming out in the next couple of days looks at Chubb as probably Yet again, one of the more overvalued picks. As it, go, he does, doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think that it does. And I, I go through some evidence on that. But, I mean, Nick Chubb is really good. And I yeah. think that in a half PPR format, 
where you got a guy who's really good. That's where you kind of feel like you want to jump out and take him some. But the issue here, and Conor O'Driscoll had an excellent article on the site last year. It was actually one of our most popular underdog articles talking about how the 2-3-1 format, so two running backs, three wide receivers, one flex, how that creates a dynamic where you just simply have to have that three starting position, which is wide receiver. You have to have that position covered. And I think the problem that we get into when we think about, well, how could we exploit these early ADPs? And one of the things that is really pretty fun, Ben, it shows how far we have come is that in terms of making the argument for zero RB for the last decade, one of the things that we would always point to is Blair Andrews win the flex tool, which shows you implied points by ADP, which show these massive advantages for wide receivers throughout the draft. And when there are these additional structural benefits of drafting wide receivers as well, if they're also giving you more points, it's a very easy calculation in terms of how you want to go about it. In 2023, that's not the case. Running backs, especially in this early range, they're projected in half PPR to outscore the wide receivers who are going next to them. But the problem comes in in terms of how you actually exploit that because there are just so few starting positions for the running back. You can't go running back, running back, running back, running back and load up on them and benefit from it in the same way. They're just so few places to put those guys. And then one of the arguments throughout the decade kind of pushing back on zero RB would be that the market is dictating that you take some of these running backs early, even if some of those other structural and scoring elements exist. Not only can you not really benefit from loading up at running back with only two starting spots, but the market is going to massively punish you if you try to do that. So one of the articles that I have out in that underdog workshop series looks at how you would take the elite QB and a hyper fragile approach at running back and build a dynamic lineup. I think that you're, if you're in a room that you know is going to not be an avalanche room, then you can experiment with some of that. But big picture, that's going to be your contrarian build that represents a small part of your portfolio. When you look at the RCE and what worked last year and what in some ways figures to work more and in some ways you have a little bit of that 2016 risk where if all the running backs stay healthy and hit, then you're going to have maybe some of these running back heavy lineups that work. But 2023 is pushing in the direction of five or six wide receivers in the first seven rounds. And then the thing that you and I were kind of talking about before the show is that not only does that make it hard to draft running backs, but it also creates an interesting dynamic if you're trying to work in an elite player at the onesie positions. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we, we, we kind of call all that stuff detours, and we've always referred to them as sort of detours to the, to the goal of getting wide receiver depth through the first maybe 10 rounds. And, and with that window shrinking, you have less room for detours. It's sort of the, you know, the simple, you know, easy way to think through it. As you point out, it's not that simple. If you look at things like the win the flex tool, the running back position is outscoring the receiver. And maybe there's this argument, hey, we do need to just build everywhere else and be really strong everywhere else and just take a bunch of flyers at receiver. I mean, it's not that that's not um, worth considering or thinking through. Uh, a big part of the zero RB discussion has always been um, not necessarily to replicate elite high-end running back scoring, it's been that it's a completely different way of building the puzzle. And we joke sometimes that like, you know, wide receiver points and running back points count the same. Like people think that the elite running backs, how high they score, you have to have that player. And it's like running back points are worth twice as much. And they're not. I mean, you can score everywhere else and score less at running back. And it's how does it all add up? Um, and in my article uh, today, I, I wrote a little bit about how I think that's, that a similar dynamic to that is, is occurring with the elite quarterbacks right now where everyone's saying, I, I just can't match the elite court, quarterbacks upside. Well, if you take a three late round quarterback and build, you know, last year we're talking calling a Frankenstein running back room, build a Frankenstein quarterback room with three quarterbacks in best ball. And you get to, because of the best ball element, take the, the, the spike weeks from any of those three quarterbacks. You're not going to maybe, uh, you know, match Jalen Hurts or, or Josh Allen in a, in a, in a ceiling season, 
But if you get a little bit of luck with that, the way that you get a little bit of luck with a zero RB room, sometimes you can at least be within shouting distance. And that's sort of the point. Like you don't have to have the elite quarterback scoring as the only path to the highest scoring team. There are ways to build it, build the puzzle differently. So point I'm saying is there's a lot of different ways to build this. There's a lot of ways to consider how to approach things. One consideration, as you mentioned, could be to, you know, you're, you're playing around on the workshop and I love that you're doing this. And uh, you mentioned to me, it's like, you know, maybe still not the most viable thing in the world, but you're like, hey, let's look at a hyper fragile running back build with an elite quarterback. Let's put as much stress as possible on the receiver room that we haven't taken any receivers. Can we still build, uh, you know, a, a viable team? What does the uh, historical data tell us in terms of win rates and those things? It's it's an awesome article. I suggest everybody go look, look at it, but the easy path when you really start to think about it and break it down is let's just still try to get some receivers because there's multiple other things that happen. One of the big ones that you and I agree on, and I, we were just talking before the show about this and you brought it up and I had already written about it in the, the article I wrote today is that there's like a, there's a really nice, I called it the running back target zone right after that wide receiver window ends in round nine, round 10 ish, where there are, Guys like Rashad Penny and Damian Harris and Samaj P. Ryan, some veterans, but guys that, I mean, if you've only taken one running back till that point, are nice RB2s, RB3s, can build out, you can still get a pretty nice little running back room. So you get really receiver heavy early. What does it mean? Oh, I'm not going to have any upside at running back. Well, I mean, you could go zero RB, but if you have one anchor running back and you get a couple of those guys, because running backs push down with the elite quarterbacks and the, and the receivers being pushed up, you still wind up with some really nice, they're almost like dead zoning prof- profiles, but you're getting them sort of like Josh Jacobs last year we talked about, or, or Miles Sanders. People wanted to say that the dead zone's no longer a thing because those, but those guys were a lot cheaper. Miles Sanders is the better example. Jacobs was a little bit different in the way that he scored. Sanders scored like a dead zone back, but he did so from like the ninth round. And that made him a lot more viable than, you know, maybe f- five years earlier, he would have been a fifth round pick last year. That's sort of what I'm, hoping for or looking at when, it, when we're looking at this running back target zone, you can still get enough running back depth. So you have to be thoughtful about those detours. You have to be thoughtful through the first six, seven, eight rounds. I think that's the key part of every one of these drafts, Sean. And I mean, for the most part, I think you only want to make like two detours in the first eight rounds. And if you can handle that uh, appropriately, there, there are some drafts where I've made more, but again, like I don't know that I've made up for it at receiver. I can tell myself stories that I've made up for, but the reality is I don't actually believe those stories having built a lot of teams over the years. Right. So um, the, to circle all the, all the way back around the positions that you're going to make the detours on the question is where are you making the most impact? And I do think anchor running backs don't make a huge impact in elite tight ends. We know make a huge impact or can, when you hit, you have Travis Kelsey last year, huge impact, right? The quarterback position is still the one for me. That's like, I can't justify it as as easily. And to put some numbers on that, five of the top eight QBs in playoff advance rate last year came with triple digit ADPs. And so that point that you made that you don't necessarily have to score with the top QBs. You just have to score overall in a way that works. The total points from your roster very much reflected in last year's advance rates. The flip side of it, and I think the part that gets people excited, and this is what I wrote about for how you want to execute the elite QB, is that you do have some elements where in the playoffs with these sort of three individual mini tournaments that you're going to have some issues matching some of the top quarterbacks. And you're going to especially have some issues matching the top quarterbacks if they're also there with their stud wide receiver. But for me, Ben, in order for this to work, you really do have to have a one-two punch here where both the receiver hits and the QB hits. Otherwise, you're going to get massacred by playing these elite QB prices. And then part of the problem there is that the elite wide receivers that you're discussing are extremely expensive. When you look at when you look forward and not just back, when you look forward in 2023, there are meaningful i won't say significant but there are meaningful problems with stefan diggs profile with aj brown's profile and those guys are the seventh and eighth overall players off the board 
Now, that's not going to be the case in every single draft, obviously. But when you look at those guys at ADP and think about what you have to pay, not just for the quarterback, but for those two players, you have almost no margin to work with after that. You're going to need to draft the perfect team behind those players. The issue that we have and that we'll get to in a moment as we work through how we approach early and then to the second wave is that the QB window guys this year, in part because everybody, you mentioned that kind of magnet that's pulling all the players up, in part because of that and in part just because of the specific guys who are available. And one of the things that that I, I, I do feel like we have discussed through the years in a way that at least is helpful for me and and hopefully helpful for some of the listeners but every year is not exactly the same and even though we emphasize structural drafting very heavily i mean you and i don't just go by adp and assume that the structure is always going to be more or less the same and the adp is more or less accurate now it is going to be more or less accurate but you have to do your own research and your own evaluation on players and there are players and I would argue the most important players every year are the guys with broken ADPs, not the guys with accurate ones. And you have to be all over these players who are not valued properly. That's where you're going to win from. And after you have figured out who those guys are, then you have to go back to your structure and say, does it still make sense? Well, you mentioned the QB window and the QB window is not populated with exciting quarterbacks. So that then forces you to ask the question, do I want to go early with it or do I want to go late with it? Which is something that has not been historically affected at all. And so if you decide to go late, which I think is very interesting, but if you decide to go late, you need to understand that you're swimming upstream against at least what's happened in the past, which again, doesn't mean it's going to happen this season. But as we look at those early rounds, the thing that jumps out to me with what you're saying, with what the win the flex tool is saying, with the wide receiver avalanche is that for me, the 2023 season is saying there are two main objectives that you have to accomplish. One is getting your wide receiver depth and the other is potentially taking advantage of these running back values that you're being given. And the only way that you can do both of those things simultaneously is to wait at the onesie positions. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to every time, but yeah, that that, that it does seem to be. Those are the teams that are that feel like they have a real shot as I build them. I'd love to still get an elite tight end as sort of the only, um, only or or maybe it's you know one of the things I was saying to you is when I when I get like maybe one anchor running back, one elite tight end, and like six early receivers i feel pretty good through eight rounds but um i mean there's an argument that because of what happens at receiver that you'd almost want to be even heavier than that like maybe it's six receivers through seven seven rounds instead of through eight and then it, you know can you actually hit the the right running back in the eighth round or, or tight end or whatever there's always as you were saying there's always changes in 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 these things year to year and there's always sort of subtleties and how to convey these changes and so sometimes it's hard to like to accurately hit on it um one of the other points that we were just sort of discussing as i'm looking at the current adp in the last week on the, the underdog adp tool at rotoviz russell wilson is the qb 18 he's going at 11 12 so you get to this the what was the when you were doing the QB window research a couple of years ago? I think was the first time you started doing the QB like hit two QBs in the window was what like 2020? I think when you first started doing the best ball workshop, you did a lot of really great work on the QB window, right? And we're mostly looking at the QB six seven to the QB right. like 16 ish type of range as being window QBs. And then kind of what you have to pay for them on a round price is going to fluctuate a little bit year to year. Yeah. So it was sort of it, exactly. And and so I guess that was kind of where I was going with it. it was like, what rounds were we looking at then and how that has shifted? Because I mean, yeah, there's still ways to implement that, but it's sort of similar to some of the shifts with the dead zone that we've talked about, Sean. And, and um, I mean, the QB six is now a fourth round pick. Justin Fields is going at the end of the fourth round. QB seven goes in the fifth round. 
Um, and then you get into like traditionally the QB window was more like round seven to round 11. Right. And so we're talking about like further back in the wide receiver window when you can hit on these QBs. Now it's like, you got to get all these wide receiver picks out of the way early before they run out. You mentioned the eighth round receivers that started with, uh, you know, Rashad Bateman, that list that you read a little bit ago. I think Bateman is an interesting name, but I think what that list was to me was a great list. It had Elijah Moore, Zay Flowers, Michael Thomas, Cortland Sutton. That's like right where the wide receiver window is closing. That's like the transition group. You can like some of those names. I think the the names going prior to that include like, you know, Quentin Johnston, Jahan Dotson. Um, some of those guys go right, you know, in the range right before it. And I think those guys are clearly in the wide receiver window and targets to be going after. And the names after that, you pretty quickly get into like, Alan Lazard, and you're talking about okay, we're we're outside the wide receiver window. Like that's that's the transition. It's the eighth round. It's happening. This this transition out of the wide receiver window. You got to get receivers by that point, and then okay, it's. I mean, again, just to, like to put even a little bit more of an underline under it because I, it's it's shocking. I think right, round nine, Jamison Williams, a guy who has basically not played at the NFL level. And when he did play last year, played poorly, and then now it's suspended for the first six games. Right. Juju yeah. Smith Schuster, who was disastrously bad for the Kansas City Chiefs last year to where they <laughs> went in a different direction. And Alan Lazard, who failed in his attempt or his opportunity, I should say, to be the wide receiver one with Aaron Rodgers. And I mean, I think that you could also blame Aaron Rodgers, but in a season where Aaron Rodgers, in part because of who his receivers were, collapsed from MVPs to then when I was looking up his adjusted net yards per attempt earlier today to kind of get a little feel for what the upside would be for Garrett Wilson compared to, to what these guys were dealing with last year. It was shocking to me to realize, even though I had watched all of those games, that Aaron Rodgers was below six adjusted net yards per attempt because he was really bad last year for the Packers. And again, whichever way you want to blame that, I mean, Alan Lazard in round nine is absurd. It's crazy. That's about where he was going. I mean, he wasn't going a ton higher. He got a little bit more expensive, but last year, and last year the argument was he was the number one. He was going to be Aaron Rodgers' number one. Now he's got Garrett Wilson on his team. Like, it's a little bit of a different... Anyway, he's not going that much later than last year. It's, it's sort of crazy. You're... Yeah, those are obvious. And Juju, you mentioned, wasn't great for KC last year and now goes to an obviously worse offense that no one wants to pay for anyone else on New England. I mean, you can get Mac Jones free. You can get the tight ends free. You can get Tyquan Thornton, who's starting to scream up ADP a little bit, still get him crazy cheap. But Juju is, you know, sitting here. Anyway, that's pretty clearly the transition there. And so the, the, the net result is you're sitting on the clock in round seven. You have to make a decision on, like, can I, like, I know not everyone drafts like us and you're on the clock in round seven. You have four receivers, one running back and one tight end. Most people look at that and they go, I need a second running back. I have four receivers already. I look at that like, man, I'm only going to have five receivers when this wide receiver window slams shut. And I'm going to have to take multiple receivers with later round ADPs that you mentioned in one of your recent articles. And you mentioned it uh, reference that you had mentioned it on your new show with Pete. Um, that the the range from I think you said from wide receiver sixty to wide receiver ninety, there's maybe like four draftable wide receivers in that range. I mean, and that's ultimately what it comes down to. We're, we're a lot of the answer in the in the underdog drafting community right now is well, just throw those guys onto your stacks. Just add another guy to one of your stacks. And I made a reference in my um, my write up today about how that's why like you know Van Jefferson's a thing again because people are just ah eh, we got to throw him under our Cooper Cup Matthew Stafford stack. And you know anytime I can. You know, throw some shade at Van Jefferson. I, I have to take that opportunity, but it is that type of a play where it's like, yeah, this guy, like Van Jefferson, his own profile, there's not a lot to like, but well, he's going to run a lot of routes and he's a part of my stack that I already built. So I'm going to throw him on there. That's what a lot of those receivers are, are to people's builds. And I understand that the, the power of stacking and all of that stuff, but we also have to understand that wide receivers are positioned where like talent matters and you're, just to advance your team and to get your team in position to win money, you have to hit on players. You have to build a team that succeeds. Ultimately, as you stated just a minute ago, the goal of fantasy football is to find league winners, is to find the guys whose ADPs are broken, right? Who are going to outperform their ADP by several rounds. Every time you just add 
a Van Jefferson to a stack or whatever, because you need another receiver at the late round of your build, you're taking an opportunity away from building a team. And not everybody in the Van Jefferson ADP range has any kind of upside at all, but that's why you have to think intelligently about how do I get something out of that part of my draft? Because I get 18 picks. I get 18 shots to find guys that actually move the needle. And that's who wins fantasy is moving the needle. So the whole idea of structure, maximizing the ability to get these guys that can win the needle. And then we build in correlation and stacks and all of those things. I mean, that stuff matters, obviously. And we are trying to build that in, but you still have to think. Through. And so again, all the way back to the wide receiver window, when I get on the clock in, in round seven, I'm always feeling the stress and the pressure of the wide receiver position and the window that is about to slam shut. And that I want to take wide receivers there. I'm not taking a quarterback. I'm not taking Deshaun Watson in the seventh round after the way he played last year. I understand that they're talking about being more of a spread offense. I understand the last time he played in Houston, he led the league in yards per attempt. I think it was for a four and 12 team. He was good. The last time he played in Houston, it's been a couple of years removed. He wasn't good enough for me to be justifying a seventh round ADP when the opportunity cost is what you can do at court wide receiver. So you get through that wide receiver window and, and it used to be that you could take a quarterback in the QB window there. But now you're talking about like Anthony Richardson in the eighth. You're talking about, I mean, I like Tua. Tua's 902. Uh, you're talking about Kirk Cousins as 1001, ADP of, uh, of the first pick of the 10th round. He's Kirk Cousins. I mean, that's not to say that the Vikings aren't going to throw a ton. You don't want to be taking, uh, you do want to be taking Jefferson or Hawkinson and those guys, but Kirk Cousins doesn't even need to be a part of those stacks because he's like, he doesn't add any rushing ability. He doesn't really add any upside. What's the point of a 10th round Kirk Cousins? You can still stack the Vikings passing game without taking Cousins in the 10th round at a, an egregious ADP, in my opinion. I mean, you get to that area of these drafts and it's like, I can't draft. Jared Goff was one of those guys who had the elite advance rates that you just mentioned from the deep ADPs, but last year's ADP was 200. And I didn't like it. You liked him a lot last year and you were on him, but I didn't like him because he also doesn't run enough. And so you have to have truly elite passing numbers. You were right to be wanting him in the 20th round. Sean, I can't get around. On, should I be drafting Jared Goff in the 11th round? I mean, what do I do here? the 11th round for Jared Goff, he's a, he's a statue. And so, and again, this is the range where you can hit some prime running back targets. So what do you do with the, the QB window data and, and all that research that we've done? How do you make these picks, even if it means filling up a stack, how do you take Kirk Cousins in the, in the 10th round at an ADP that puts him ahead of, here are the next four running backs, Antonio Gibson, Rashad Penny, Damian Harris, and Devin A. Chain, who I know a lot of people like, Sean, I'm not sure you're, I think you and I talked about this a little bit ago, and I think you're in agreement with me. I'm not super in on HN, and especially obviously now that there's some Dalvin Cook buzz to landing in Miami, but like Gibson, Penny, Damian Harris in that range, they have a cheaper ADPs than Kirk Cousins. I just, I mean, it's so clear which of those players can be the ones that that make a massive impact on your fantasy team and on your draft. So anyway, that was the whole, we were talking about this late round quarterback idea and whether or not the, the multi-year trends really favor it. That's, I mean, that's that's what that's sort of what we're talking about. It's a hard puzzle to figure out the solution to in 2023 when you look at those types of realities. And the QB window is one that is interesting, I think, kind of on a per draft basis, because unlike running back and wide receiver, where in most cases, and, and there'll be some individual guys in individual drafts, but the pull of ADP is so strong to where you don't get much in the way of real fallers in the top 10, 11 rounds. That's not always the case at quarterback. And so you can target simply fallers and you'll get these guys at much better prices than their actual ADP that builds in some overall value for you on your roster as well, which can be nice to have, especially if you're emphasizing your own targets as opposed to ADP values in the first eight or nine rounds. But some of the things you mentioned there, I think are really interesting because when you think of Jerry Goff and how he would fit into a tournament winning scenario, I mean, he's going to need Jamison Williams to come on in the second half and blow up. And while that could happen, because Williams is a tricky pick in his own right, when you're trying to put all of that together, I think that part is difficult. I mean, Jared Goff, you think about the guy with him, Amon Ra St. Brown. Amon Ra, really the perfect example of someone you more or less just want to draft on his own. And you have that kicker on your in your lineup of an elite wide receiver. You look at Geno Smith at QB 
15. And in part because actually all three of his receivers are exciting. They're all three overvalued. And so to get Geno Smith, you've got to draft him at a price that's difficult, but also for him to really have value, you want him with at least one, if not multiple other Seahawks, which means you've now overpaid all through the, <laughs> through the draft on those guys. I'm a little more optimistic on Kirk Cousins, even though I don't think he's a great player in that having all three of his receivers blow up seems not that hard to imagine. And in that case, if you can put them together, and there are a lot of ways to do Jeff, Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson together, where then you have Kirk Cousins. And I think that's one of the teams I did with Pete, where we had those three guys. I kind of like that if Kirk Cousins is not someone you're reaching for, if it's someone who's falling to you. I was Russell, looking my my first fast draft that I ever did when I when I traveled down uh, on underdog, when I traveled down last weekend, was a Cousins Ritter two QB it was the only QBs I took. And it was a Hawk. It, I got with the one one on my first draft. I took Jefferson. I took Hawkinson. I got a double. I do think that's very viable, but like uh, the reason I was looking is I was going to try to give the listeners an idea of just how gross the QB room can look on some of these builds. And I mean, I don't love it. I, and on some of them, I'm like, yeah, it seems probably dead because the QBs are that bad. And I pushed it too far, but I mean, how, what is the logical conclusion here? Other than because I think for a lot of people, when they see those Kirk Cousins and Jared Goff prices, they're thinking that's why I'm taking an elite QB. It, it solves a, a few things for me. Then I don't have to take this egregious price on Jared Goff in the 11th round either. I can just take Jalen Hurts, take one at the very end and have two QBs and I'm done. And I understand that, that but the, that's where I go back to emphasizing that I, you take too many, you know, of those detours. And I, I'm all right mixing that in occasionally, right? But you still get the receiver depth. That's maybe a more zero RB build, or it's a it's a late round tight end build. You have maybe one early running back, and those are the only two detours. Otherwise, you're going to wind up with not enough receiver depth in the early part, like we were talking about. And so the real answer is okay. The elite QB is still tough. The wide receiver or QB window was tough, especially once you hit enough receivers early that you have to hit some running backs in nine and 10. And then you're looking at QBs in 11 and you're like, I can't draft these guys. And so it has to be late round corporate. So how gross are you willing to push it? Anyway, I just wanted to, I mean, it's for me, it's like, I'll take QBs with the last couple of picks and just call it good. <laughs> and the other element here is that these guys are going to get less expensive. And so it depends on whether or not you're drafting in a format that is going to fill and be done <laughs> With similar prices or if you're drafting in best ball mania and you can more or less assume that later drafters are going to have more information on their late picks and better prices on their qb window guys so they have multiple edges on you there that you've got to figure out a way to overcome in the present if you want to draft right now and one of the ways to potentially overcome that is to go with qb late because the guys who are going in the 16th, 17th, 18th rounds, they can't get more <laughs> inexpensive than that. That's the end of the draft. The other thing there is that the 16, 17, 18, where you're going to have a lot more information to make good selections later on, you can't sell that out by simply using those picks at quarterback and tight end. The other thing I would mention here, Ben, too, is that if we look at the guys who traditionally hit and make the QB window such a thing. And we look at the guys who hit last year and make the QB window important. You're talking about, generally speaking, and there are going to be some exceptions because there are going to be some veteran pass-oriented QBs that have sort of those one-off strong seasons. But you're generally talking about second and third year breakout or secondary breakout quarterbacks, many of whom also have at least some hybrid rushing ability. This is a bad year for that in general, especially a bad year if you don't want to take risks. But then there are a few of those QBs, and and where are they currently landing? Yeah, I mean they're going. To the end. You're talking about Sam Howell and Desmond Ritter. I mean you're talking about. I mean I don't know how much mobility Brock Purdy has, but the more we hear about his arm, the more I, I've mixed him into some drafts. Like I mean if I'm if I are especially if I've already picked like a Debo. Um, I'm not drafting a ton of the, the San Fran skill players, honestly, but um, I am drafting Washington players and they play each other in week 17. So I do get some of those, you know, going back and forth in, in those games because I am in a lot of drafts thinking, well, Sam Howell's going to be my 18th round pick here. I mean, anyone who's listened to Silly Bananas knows that we always got to be thinking about how we can get Sam Howell on the roster. Um, 
but yeah, Ritter teams taking plenty of pits. Uh, but when I have taken the Debo or like a Kittle or something, Purdy, I think, makes a lot of sense in the re- regard that, you know, you're sort of for those San Fran scenarios saying it is a Purdy season. It's not a Lance season. I, I don't really think Sam Donald's a legitimate threat to play a lot. But if he played two, it would probably be better for the passing game. But in terms of the overall pass volume, I think if Trey Lance is under center, you're talking about a significant shift in the number of actual pass attempts. It'd be very similar to the impact Justin Fields has, I think on Chicago's passing volume. And so anyway, if you're already making that bet a little, you know, on, on, the, on the San Fran players, I think adding Purdy makes sense. I'm curious what you think about that. Obviously I'm still kind of debating it. Um, but Ritter, Howell we talked about them. You got the rookies, Sean, you wrote about Pickett recently in the, in the um, Pittsburgh receiving weapons being um, good values and good prices. And when you hit them, you can get Kenny Pickett in the late rounds. I've taken some Kyler Murray because I'm taking a lot of Rondell Moore. Because once you get outside the wide receiver window, Rondell Moore is one of the few guys that I do think is still you know viable to be going after. Uh, and then maybe I'm grabbing Kyler and just saying, I really hope he's healthy. It's a lot of risk. It's a lot of risk on Brock Purdy. It's a lot of risk on Sam Howell and Desmond Ritter. I'm not saying it's not, but there's risk on every pick. And I, again, we do this every year, but like people think early running back touches are guaranteed. They don't think there's risk there, right? They think they're... Ah, I've taken three or four receivers early. I've got enough receivers. They don't think there's risk there. Like, no, there is. You you miss on these. Some of these guys just suck sometimes. Some of these offenses suck. Some Like, I don't think people remember how busts happen by the next June. Everyone's just optimistic about the season for every single team, and every ADP looks great, and every player is going to be fantastic. Like, some of these receivers are going to suck in the early rounds, even though we're targeting them. A lot of the running backs are not going to perform. A lot of the tight ends are not going to perform. Remember last year, all we got was Kelsey. He was 100 points better than everyone else. No one else was any good. I mean, even the early QBs, which everyone has used to push up all of the early QBs, was three guys. It was, it was Mahomes, Hertz, and Allen. Burrow to a little bit of a lesser extent, right? But Justin Herbert was going super high. Sean, that was a guy we didn't like last year. Really low advance rate. Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson both got hurt, but weren't on the way to great seasons either. And those are guys that I took a lot of. I was really excited about them. I was wrong about it. They were not performing at that level when they got hurt, either of them. Dak was going pretty high. Didn't, you know, he got hurt as well. But I'm trying to think of who else was in like, you know, the the double digit ADPs, sub 100 ADPs last year. But there were a lot of misses in that range too. I mean, there there are busts. And you want to think about the dynamics that really dictated the season. And it wasn't just that you had the elite QB scoring and the elite QB scoring with their wide receiver one being stacked onto a lot of those teams where the participants who drafted them got the benefit of both. But you had the opposite effect with QB window guys where you have a ton of injured players and then that also also neutralizes their receivers to make the receivers bad picks as well, which is one of the reasons why even if you're not thinking about it from a playoff perspective, that there is some value, even though, again, it is overstated but there is some value to correlating some of those results as you put your teams together. You mentioned Howell and Purdy and Ritter, and I like all three of those guys, but a lot of people are going to push back and say, those are late round picks. And so you don't have much of a moat when you start to perform poorly. The interesting thing is you do get the impression that Purdy has performed so well in the eyes of the 49er staff that he has actually generated enough that even being injured, that he has that position more or less won if he can go out there and play, but a couple other names who are interesting because they're first round picks where the team has a lot of incentive to see them succeed would be Mac Jones and Kenny Pickett. And you mentioned Pickett, but to have two former first round picks where you have a potential second year breakout with Pickett surrounded by elite weapons. And you have Mac Jones who actually had a good rookie season. And now is that third year breakout post hype kind of guy who not only is very inexpensive himself, but has some names that aren't, you know, super exciting names that you're going to feel like, oh, this is going to win it for me, but has some inexpensive names that you can put on teams with him to make that work. So if you want to build out a stack that is not expensive, Mac Jones is one of your best so easy. paths. Yeah. So you have really five options there late that are potentially dynamic. And when we have that many different options, I think it makes sense to start layering some of those guys into these teams, saving early picks and not just really flagrantly throwing away late picks on guys who 
I mean, right. you're going to look at some of these teams at the end of the season and be like, why did I draft someone who had a 10% snap share for the season? It's like, well, Can you I didn't just... know. There's no way you could have known at this point in time. Right. Can I tell you uh third quarterback I drafted the other day that's going even later than any of those players? So this is where I want to press how far we need to be taking this because you are someone who's willing to press it with me. Um, I mean, I have not taken Baker yet, but I, you can, you can convince me. Garoppolo doesn't seem like he might even be healthy for week one. So he's tough. The guy I took was Ryan Tannehill, who like, we didn't love Will Levis as a prospect. He fell into day two. Yes. The Titans then made the move and went and got him, but we are, um, I mean, I, and there was a lot of talk all offseason, and people seemed to think that Tannehill was going to get dealt to Atlanta um, and be Arthur Smith's starter or whatever, or you know, maybe just loses his job to Will Levis. But now, like, the latest thing has been that DeAndre Hopkins might land there, and I don't actually know that Did you draft that. a Hopkins Tannehill team? Is that what you're telling us? I don't think I took Hopkins and Tannehill. I think I actually had Tannehill um, – I was in a scenario, I think, where I had to take an unstack QB. So I think I took Tannehill unstack, but I needed a third. It was a really late QB build where things didn't really go the way that I wanted in the late rounds. But part, so that was part of why I took Tannehill as well, as I was kind of like, I think he could have some points, but also not really be stacked with players that, I mean, I think Burks is the only one that anyone's stacking him with, if anyone's even drafting him. So it's sort of like, I'm not losing to other Tannehill stacks that are in the player field necessarily or at least that was a the theory. But anyway, um, you mentioned there's those five options. Sometimes they do go. I, I try to wait for them in you know in the very last round, and they do go. And so I guess the question is, and, and I think that's why people are afraid of it. I mean, I think in theory this feels good, but then when you go through the draft and you get to the 13th round, you're like, ah, I could take you know, a stacked Derek Carr or whatever, and then, you know, the 13th, or I could keep pushing it and wait till I get, you know, my my chance at Sam Howell late, but the risk is what if Sam Howell goes? I don't get it, you know, I don't get to come back and take Derek Carr in the 13th. So I got to make this decision now in the 13th. I'm going to take Derek Carr in the 13th. It's really hard to really push it until those last five guys. And, and then I can tell you, because I've tried it, sometimes those guys all go. What do you do then? Do you take Tannehill? Do you cry in the shower? Do you, <laughs> how, do you, how do you approach? you just light that money on fire does that team no longer exist to you because it doesn't have any quarterbacks um i think that's a legitimate fear but it's also why you can build some really great teams if you're willing to take that on and you can gently push people off those qbs a little bit by setting it up for yourself now again that's no guarantee but you have a little bit of that dynamic you can also try and set it up for multiple guys which is what I would vaguely recommend is that you can set up for Sam Howell and Mac Jones. The chances that both of those guys get taken are not zero, but relatively minimal. I mean, they go so late. You can also set it up to where Brock Purdy and Sam Howell work off of each other pretty well. Your chances of getting one of the two are pretty good. I think you can also take Desmond Ritter without other members of the Falcons. I, there are viable paths to where he does run a little bit more. You do get the shots from Pitts or London, but it's spread enough to where you don't need those players. If you've got someone who brings some rushing upside like Sam Howell, I think you can do him again empty in the last round if you feel like you need that third quarterback. I also think, though, that if you set it up for a 3QB build and – your build overall is dynamic and you get locked out of the third guy, then just don't worry about it. Take the best pick available in round 18 and take some of the value that you get from having just the two QBs because there are values to a three QB build. There are values to a two QB build, but there are obvious trade-offs. If you get locked out, take the advantages of just having the two, make sure that you're flexible enough to call the audible in that situation. So don't take Ryan Tannehill. Well, <laughs> Tannehill is an interesting name. Interesting name. I, I think it would be. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this because, I mean, anytime I say the name, I don't say the name very often. Anytime I think the name Baker Mayfield, 
all that I see are like 15 passes into the offensive line. Yeah. And that doesn't thrill me. But Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, even when you adjust for how bad the QB play is, they're two of the most undervalued players in all of underdogs. So you're going to have a lot of exposure if you have exposure on the same team and you get to round 18 and you get locked out of somebody you like better, then I think that it makes sense. Yeah. But so I mean, I either Baker that. Mayfield or Kyle Trask is going to throw passes for the Buccaneers and they're going to throw a lot more passes than people are pricing it. Right. Yeah. Somebody on that roster, I agree with that, is going to have some, some QB points late. My thought on Tannehill was there are still some scenarios where he gets traded. There's some potential scenarios where he gets traded in season. If there's a QB injury before the trade deadline and they do decide they want to go to Levis, I do think they're going to go to Levis at some point. But then the other third scenario that I was thinking through is what if they go to Levis and he's bad and he just has to get benched again? Um, like the, the name that I always go back to on that is Deshaun Kaiser, his rookie season. He was like in and out and in and out and in and out for the Browns. Um, anyway, if Levis is like, there were some concerns about him as a prospect and as, and, and if he comes in and he's tragically bad, I mean, Ryan Tannehill is a competent veteran quarterback. He led this team to the number one seed in the AFC just two seasons ago, 2021, 2022 didn't go the way they expected. But I, I mean, I don't think it's crazy that he could be a quarterback for most of 2023 or in spar- in spurts. Like if he's part of a three quarterback build, he starts at the beginning of the year, Levis takes over and he either gets traded and is playing somewhere else or takes back over for Levis and, and finishes the season for the Titans or at least plays a few more games or whatever. I mean, like I was telling myself these scenarios were possible with Tannehill, but it's probably not the, I, I just think when you look at him on the merits of who he is as a player, he's not like a bad quarterback probably one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the NFL probably deserves to be starting somewhere. Maybe he's with the box at some point. I'm hearing you say that you think Traylon Burks should be going ahead of wide receiver 37 because the, yeah. the select Ryan Tannehill, I do think that you're putting Burks more in that wide receiver 20 range, which is not absurd at all. That's right. Where Christian Watson yeah. is going, he's going to have potentially some quarterback issues. He's going to probably have more, teammate competition than Burks is going to have and Burks had some injuries he had egregiously bad QB play it's easy to think of someone like a Garrett Wilson who overcame (laughs) the situation with the Jets and assume that anybody who is an elite prospect would have done that but especially when you're dealing with a low volume passing offense and your own injuries it's going to be difficult to have a season that's too much better than what Burks actually did which was I think much. I think that's a great point and I yeah having admitted that I took a Tannehill team I wish I could I could admit that it was a Burks team I just pulled it up the reason I felt I needed a third QB is it was a Purdy team Purdy Ritter Tannehill wound up being my quarterbacks I mean I'm, that's, that's the kind of quarterback room I'm building right now I just want the listeners to know that I'm serious about this like that's a BBM team the running backs the receivers the tight ends all great quarterbacks uh need a little work so then as we look through it there are also many tiers at the running back and wide receiver position we've discussed a lot of what to do at quarterbacks just want to get a few quick thoughts for you here as we sort of wrap up at what you are doing early at wide receiver and running back because i think that one of the subtle things at least for me at wide receiver is not just that you need to take them early but that also there aren't that many picks in any given round that are that appealing either It's not just that wide receiver runs out by the end of round seven. It's that a lot of the receivers being selected in the first seven rounds are objectively terrible picks. So if you have. (laughs) (laughs) Don't sugarcoat it. Don't sugarcoat it at all. So, so what are we looking at here? Sort of quick thoughts, round one, round two. I mentioned that I think that those wide receivers who are paired with the elite quarterbacks are overvalued in a vacuum we also have Devonte adams who has uh, he's <laughs> mentioned that he's got some questions about their offense there are also questions about his qb those guys all in the first round which i think is tough the second round at wide receiver a lot of fun the young yeah. up-and-coming stars how, how are you playing those first two rounds so i I have only done 30 drafts. And one of the things that happens is you do get your, your, your draft spots concentrated a little bit sometimes. Right. So I got more than my share, 
101s. I got more than my share of 105s and then also some 104s and 106s. And all of those wound up being, almost all of them wound up being Cooper Cup, Tyreek Hill teams. I, I, I think I have one McCaffrey team. And some of that was because I was taking those receivers over McCaffrey. I probably would have balanced it a little bit more, but then the other ones were the ones where like, it's usually one of those receivers who falls to 106 when somebody reaches for somebody else. It's not usually McCaffrey that falls to 106. And so I, I got, and I, I'm very comfortable with both of those veterans. Um, I, do, I do have one Jamar Chase team as well as a, I have one 102, but a lot of Jefferson. I think I have at least a handful of Jefferson teams. And then a lot, I got a lot of um, 112, 111 type picks. And yeah, I mean, I like Garrett Wilson and Amon Ross St. Brown, whose ADPs are in the early part of the second round. I did one team from the 112 with those two and passed up Adams, took some Adams, took some Lamb. I did not get a lot of picks in the like six to eight, nine range. Um, I, I, you know. So you've avoided the worst picks. The Yeah. So the listeners will hear that you were saying some mean things about AJ Brown and I didn't really back him up, but like, John, you and I have already talked about this. I, AJ Brown has an ADP of eight. Like that. I love AJ Brown, but there's not a ton of meat left on the bone from what that Philadelphia offense did last season in terms of skyrocketing volume in terms of how concentrated they already were. I wrote about the RPO offenses. We talked about on the last show a little bit. Um, love AJ Brown. think he can definitely put in that kind of season again. I don't think he really has a lot of scenarios in this offense and in this setup where he can get up to the Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase level. And if you're drafting a receiver at eight, that's what you're doing. I would be fine taking him in the early second round, you know, behind some of these guys. Last year I was arguing he kind of belonged in the early second and he performed how I thought he should. But now people have jumped him up into the top 10 and solidly in the top 10. And I just think that's a really aggressive price, even for basically my favorite player. And if Hill um, and Cup are remotely healthy, I mean, A.J. Brown in that offense can't touch him. He can't touch him. And there's people that are drafting Brown top five to do the Philly stack where they can get Devonta in the second round, Hurts in the third. And I just, I mean, apart from, I wrote a little bit about this in the article, I won't go into it a bunch right now, but apart from, putting all of your first three picks eggs in, in the Philly basket and not getting exposure to any other players in the top 45 picks where there's a lot of other good names there. And you probably want exposure to different, you know, uncorrelated options because there's going to be some different league winners in the top three rounds. Apart from that, just moving AJ Brown into the top five and intentionally taking him in the top five, just to differentiate gives up a lot of projected points against the receivers that are going top five in my mind, as much as I love AJ Brown, it's still, it's giving up, a lot to, to, to say that I'm going to take him straight up over Cooper cup, which I know again, people are doing just to get unique, but there's a, there's an element there where like, yeah, to get unique, you don't want to give up too much, you know, projected points and too much uh, ADP value. And just getting from the late first up into the top five, I think gives up a lot of value. Um, so anyway, I'm with you there. I think that's a tough wide receiver range. The second round is really great. The third round is an interesting running back range. That's where I have taken some of my anchor running backs. You get Ramondre Stevenson and you get Brees Hall. Um, you can get Jameer Gibbs, sometimes even into the fourth. Um, and ETN and Ken Walker, when you get good prices on them, I'm, I'm hitting those guys. So I do sometimes hit some running backs in those ranges. Um, and I'm taking a little Jonathan Taylor and you know some running backs higher up. But uh, B. John Robinson a little bit in the first round. Um, well, let me give you the third round wide receivers here. You have wide receiver 15 is DK Metcalf, who does have Pete Carroll as his head coach. So you're probably not going to end up at the extreme upper end of QB pass attempts. You have two other potentially dynamic receivers in that offense. And you have Metcalf having taken a step back the last couple of years. Now, not a step back to being a bad player, but a step back from a couple of years ago where he looked like a viable, you know, even overall wide receiver one in Dynasty. Calvin Ridley, <laughs> who hasn't played and has multiple other good receivers in that offense. Debo Samuel, who has all of those volume issues with the offense and with Ayuk and Kittle there. And then Amari Cooper, who is being drafted at an odd spot when you look at his career trajectory. You mentioned that this is the round for running backs. I completely agree with that. I don't know if there are any wide receivers there, but the thing that you can do is you can reach for a fourth round wide receiver and there are interesting yep. ways to play that. Yeah. So 
those names you just read, I have not drafted Calvin Ridley. I've not drafted Amari Cooper. I think I've taken Metcalf only once, but maybe twice. Or th- Actually, I might have taken him even as many as three times. I don't know. In my 35 drafts that I've done so far. And then Debo was one that I have taken some shots on because it's Debo Samuel and there's no other receivers to take there. But and when he, he sets up the, some of the very late things we talk about. Right. And he sets up some of those things. He sets up, uh, I, you know, I want to play Washington right now. He sets, you know, he's immediately starts to set up a San Fran Washington game stack. Um, yeah. So Keenan Allen and Jerry Judy are two guys that go around. I think you were alluding to this. We were talking about, about it a little bit before the show, but the two guys that go around the 40th pick, they almost always seem to land in the fourth round. You never see these guys fall into the fifth where wide receiver really gets tough. And so, you know, you don't see any of these fourth round receivers really fall into the fifth. Um, and you also rarely see them jump into the third because you still have, I mean, you you just named the, the third round receivers. There's only four of them that go there um, on average because it becomes a round where a lot of the running backs go off and the quarterbacks start to go off, right? And so there's other positions that are being hit People aren't usually reaching for these receivers all the way up into the third. So one of the things I've done, they they play each other, Keenan Allen and Jerry Judy in week 17. Uh, And I think objectively I would take both of those guys over like Amari Cooper, whose ADP is in the third. So when I have the late pick at the three, four turn, it does sometimes mean passing up like Debo and Deandre Hopkins, but reaching down and getting Keenan Allen in the late third and then getting Judy in the early fourth. The reason I like that is it does, you know, it's a little bit of a premium to pay for some of the correlation, the uniqueness, et cetera. But that's exactly how I would want, if I was building a DFS lineup for week 17 right now, I would want the the Keenan Allen, Jerry Judy. That's how I'd want to play it. I would not want to play it through Mike Williams. I don't, wouldn't want to play it through Cortland Sutton, although, you know, he is cheaper in drafts, so you can make some arguments. Um, You can make obviously an argument on the, on the charger side for Quentin Johnson, or even up going up to Austin Eckler. But I think, you know, games that, that shoot out between these teams are probably games where I'm thinking Keenan Allen or Jerry Judy or both are getting like 10 receptions. Like they're they're really involved in, in doing a lot and target dominating. That's what I like about their profiles in general. And so it's a fun little mini correlation that I also think can be somewhat unique because their ADPs are so similar and in the middle of a round and you rarely see them go the round before or after that like people are, not a lot of people are getting that same player on the same roster, right? So that's an example of something that now that I've you know said on stealing bananas, maybe we'll we'll see a little bit more frequently. But those are the types of things that I think are worth considering, um, especially when you're identifying. Look, the third round isn't even that strong for receivers anyway. So I don't. Yeah, I'm giving up ADP value to move both of these players up to get them both on the same team at the three four turn, and at the same time, um, I don't think I'm giving up that much within like the wide receiver position. Like broadly, we know that to be a mistake. It's, it's a mistake to give up a ton of ADP value to move guys up uh, just to correlate. But uh, we still have to apply that in the specific scenarios. And in this specific scenario, what I'm arguing is those players are in the, basically the same tier as the wide receivers that are going ahead of them. And I'm I'm moving within a tier as opposed to, to jumping a player ahead of a tier. Like we were just talking about with AJ Brown going ahead of some of the, the top five players. That's like a significant tier jump to me. So yeah. Um, that's one way that, yeah, you can play the wide receiver position there. Sean, round five is where it gets really kind of kind of gross. And uh, you're probably some of those names that you were saying are objective, objectively bad picks. One of the names that you and I agree on, and I just know this from looking at your rankings a little bit as I've been doing some drafting, um, but excited about Chris Godwin. You just mentioned him a minute ago. He started to rise a little bit, but he's a guy that I've taken in the fifth round. He's probably my most drafted player, as you were asking, sort of what I've been doing. It's a it's a tough range for wide receiver, and he feels very comfortable in the fifth. He's probably the strongest selection, maybe overall. You mentioned it gets tough in the fifth. After Judy goes, the fourth is increasingly difficult. One of the things that was interesting, and I would really encourage anybody who is interested in projecting team-level elements and total play volume and then how the rpos factor into it check out the previous show check out ceiling signals ben has done some fantastic work with that we talked about drake london who is the wide receiver 23 in the middle of round four we talked about dj moore who's the wide receiver 26 at the end of round four the two guys going in between them are mike williams who will probably be the third best receiver on his own team this year and terry mclaurin who is the 
peripherals all-star every season. But, I mean, if Sam Howell is going in the 17th round, Terry McLaurin doesn't really have any business kind of in this range in terms of what his actual scoring profile is going to be. Christian Kirk, wide receiver 27, the 501, had the same scoring profile over the second half of last season as Zay Jones, who's wide receiver 55. Now, maybe a thing where because of Calvin Ridley jumping in that it breaks out to where Kirk finishes with a lot more routes than Zay Jones. But you want to consider what you're getting when you're paying that price for Kirk and what the volume is likely to be. And then you get into the back end of five and you have Brandon Ayuk who has the same problems as Debo with lesser talent. You've got Michael Pittman who was destroyed by QB play last year and it probably gets worse before it gets better. You have JSN who's in that three wide receiver group with the Seahawks. You have Marquise Brown starting out the sixth round who is probably going to get Colt McCoy in a new offense. And then Tyler Lockett as the wide receiver 33. As we list those names off and discuss like how you're going to load up at wide receiver, it's not just loading up. You've got to be very picky in the names that you're actually selecting. Yep. I just completely agree. I mean, that's why I got asked on um, on ship chasing, I think, last week, who my high, highest drafted player is so far. And I, I said God when I just mentioned it here. I'm not certain about that because I don't think it shows your exposures. I'm not super familiar with the underdog app, actually, but I don't think it shows your exposures until you finish the drafts and I'm still in all these slows. But I'm just saying that I'll feel I, – it would not surprise me if my exposure to Chris Godwin is over 50% when these first few drafts are done. I I feel the exact same way you just said, that you have to be very selective in this range. And as a result, I I, I don't want to be that exposed to Chris Godwin. I don't think that highly of him. Uh, you know, But I – I do think there was a uh, an area here where I wanted to be targeting wide receivers generally, and there's enough of a gap between him and a lot of those profiles you just discussed to where in each of these different builds, it was like, I don't want this to be the team where I needed Chris Godwin and I didn't take, I just think he's so much, such a better play. Like it should be a tier above Michael Pittman, if not three tiers above Michael Pittman, a, a, at least a tier above Michael Pittman. And one of the things that people are doing is that they're discounting both Godwin and Evans because of poor potential quarterback play. And I say potential likely to be bottom third QB play from an efficiency perspective. But one of the things that we witnessed last year were wide receivers who were getting killed on both volume and efficiency. The Bucks receivers are unlikely to be killed on the volume part of it unless the team is much more effective overall than we expect. And kind of, as you mentioned with Rashad white earlier, unless they have a running game, that's much more dynamic. Rashad white, basically a receiving back. He was an older draft pick. He was not a good pure rusher in college. And then he was, I mean, he was so bad last year as a runner that they had to keep going back to Leonard Fournette, who was completely done. So Will they end up with one of these running backs? I mean, unless Sean Tucker becomes a thing, which would be my favorite. I mean, they're going to have one of those other guys there, but the names you mentioned of free at running backs, unless it's Dalvin Cook, which, I mean, they don't seem like they're necessarily approaching it that way. Then, I mean, you're going to have poor running back performance as well, which especially if you're facing deficits, I mean, it pushes you back to Godwin and Evans, which is where your talent is. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think... Everyone was so quick to say that because Tom Brady's gone, their their pass rate's got to come down because it was historical last year. So, so high, and it will come down. No one's arguing that. It was going to regress if Tom Brady was back. I mean, it was incredibly high. It was, it was in all likelihood going to. But the, the, this is where we want, we run into, like, mistakes as a community. Like, what is the actual range of Tampa Bay's passing volume next year? Like, they're not going to be good. They're going to trail. They don't have a good running game right now. And it's, it's still pretty high. They're going to throw. They're not going to not throw. Baker Mayfield's not a mobile quarterback. We don't have any of the issues we talked about in the last show, the RPO stuff and Justin Fields and scrambles. And I mean, there's going to be pass attempts. He, Baker ran a, a pretty run first offense in um, in Cleveland and in the other stops he was at last year. They didn't throw a ton in part because he's not very good. And, you know, teams that are not good, they don't want to have their bad quarterback throw a ton. But so, yeah, there, there are some like bad outcomes. I'm not like denying that, but I just think, at these prices, as good as Chris Godwin has been throughout his career, as good as Mike Evans has been throughout his career, who's a guy I'm also taking, um, especially when you know I get a good price on him, 
they're just they're just way too cheap, I think. In and for the reasons you just explained. You go further down after uh Lockett and Evans and those guys, and, and there there's another really fun range there, Sean, as we talk about the rest of the window. We're kind of going through it, who the targets are. Deontay Johnson, Jordan Addison is a little bit pricey, but uh, you know, exciting still rookie. Uh pricey for me in terms of his range when you have Justin Jefferson on the same you know offense. Traylon Burks, Canaries Tony's a tough one, but uh, George Pickens, Jahan Dotson. I'm still kind of backing on Gabe Davis and Quentin Johnston. That range there, starting at you know Deontay Johnson through to Quentin Johnston, the second year players in there, Pickens and Dotson and Burks. Um, it's a fun receiver range, and I I don't feel like I'm getting enough of all those guys. It's almost as we're sitting here talking about it, it's almost like I want to start taking some of those guys with 70 ADPs in the 60s so I can get more exposure to them because um, I don't think I can get enough across all of my teams, enough Burks, Pickens, Dotson, and Johnston, for example. I want to get all those guys, and their ADPs are close. I think so far I have not taken enough Burks. I have not taken enough Pickens, I don't think. I I have taken Dotson a good amount, and I've taken Quentin Johnston a good amount. Um, But, yeah, I'm trying to take Burks and Pickens. It's just that that's the way it's worked out on the individual drafts I've been in. And I would say definitely don't hesitate to reach on those players and avalanche drafts, especially And the secondary reason not to be afraid to reach on them is the guys who are going to get pushed down to you at the running back position, that round six by ADP, Miles Sanders, Damian Pierce, Alexander Madison. Those are quintessential dead zone profiles. And Ben, I mentioned a couple of my articles recently, The thing that you always say as the person who coined and has done a lot of great research on the dead zone, it's not so much about the round. It's about the running back profile. I'm not excited about those guys when they get pushed down. That doesn't mean that they couldn't have a good season, right? When we talk about not liking the profile and not wanting to draft guys, it's not saying that we're guaranteeing they'll perform poorly because there are always these unusual hits where a player will stay healthy and they'll benefit from the volume profile that people think that they have. But when you're thinking through the, pro- the probabilities and you're trying to price them, those are not the players that you want. And that extends to an extent into round seven, where you have guys like Dalvin Cook, Cam Makers, especially I think Isaiah Pacheco. Although, I mean, if everything hits for Pacheco, I mean, you could see a-, a pretty amazing season. You go into round eight, you have Rashad White, James Conner, David Montgomery. Again, some of the same problems. But once you get beyond that range, you're pushed into a very interesting group of running back ADPs. And for me, Ben, that's where you can benefit from some of the elements of 2023 specifically. And that's the reason why you might be reluctant to select QBs in that window that we talked about, because you do get into a very dynamic running back range after that. So when we think about building out these teams and where can we benefit, one of the arguments against the early point that I made, which is that the win the flex tool is telling you that running backs are going to score more here than maybe what ADP is reflecting. Part of that's going to be based on historical profiles that I think you could honestly say just don't exist right now. We went through that time period where we had the Uber backs. They were scoring a lot of points because they had these elite three down profiles. So you want to be a little bit choosy. And I mean, you and I like Stevenson and Hall, Definitely Josh Jacobs is someone who, if he could hit again, would be in that group. But once those profiles are gone, and there may not be enough of them to justify the running backs. The the great thing really is just that you can get those guys in round three. Any previous year, you would not have been able to. So I think you have to load up there. But then otherwise, running back really not exploitable again or really not draftable again until we're into that range that's the QB window. For me, that kind of wraps it back around to the beginning in terms of how I'm looking at these 2023 drafts and what the board is giving us in this very specific season. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think uh, the dead zone stuff is great. We'll have to talk about that on, a, on an upcoming show because we already beyond the, the hour mark. We, we could do another hour on that, uh, but totally agree with you. On, on that, on, on basically every name you mentioned. One guy I want to talk to you about a little bit more when we do get into the running backs more is Cam Akers. Mildly intrigued by him. Basically every other guy you said I could care less about. Uh, um, but yeah, I think that's... Uh, and I haven't even taken Akers yet. 
because it's like it's so hard. That's I'm taking a wide receiver every single time there. I just talked about he's at 77 ADP. All those other receivers I just mentioned um, that I'm not able to get enough of are all right there. Uh, Burks is 70, Pickens is 73, Dotson 76, Quentin Johnson's 81. That's a range where I'm. I probably will never take Acres, but it wouldn't surprise me, I guess, if he has a good year. We, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into some of these dead zone backs and the profiles and the things that are um, that are interesting about 2023 and the different landscape and and. But yeah, everything you just said about the areas to target running back, that third round feels nice. That pocket in the you know tenth round, ninth round, tenth round after the wide receiver window close feels nice. And that's the kind of stuff that like I'm hammering it right now. I'm doing a lot of my builds very similarly because that's the kind of thing that over the course of, you know, we, we often talk about this guy is going to change his ADP by August. And I think the community loves to talk about how individual players are going to shift by August, but it's these pockets of like fertile ground at positions. The whole pocket can change. All it takes is, you know, that running back room we're talking about there, that running back range we're talking about one really positive report on, you know, Damian Harris or Antonio Gibson or whatever. And suddenly that guy is going four rounds higher. Right. And then because of that, there's fewer, and maybe one really negative uh, piece on, you know, Zach Charbonnet, he's not going to actually play in year one or he gets hurt or something. Right. And then he's gone out of there. Now there's fewer names there. And so in every draft, you know, part of what's keeping these ADPs down, there's a lot of them, but in every draft where people like to target that range, Rashad Penny suddenly starts to creep up a little higher and higher and higher because you don't have Gibson and you don't have Charbonnet there sitting there or there's other options or, you know, it, it starts to make it, it, it adds stress. And then, and then the whole range starts to rise. And then pretty soon a couple of those guys are creeping into the end of the wide receiver window when they're going ahead of Quentin Johnston. And you're like, okay, well, I got to take the receivers now. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to chase these guys up to that range. It, it can be a thing where it's not just one player's ADP that shifts but the entire sort of fertile ground that is that running back area right now, it's because there's so many interesting running backs with similar ADPs that a couple of them get pulled out. Suddenly the whole, the whole range starts to shift up and, and the, the fertile ground is no more. We see that. And, and that type of a shift could be coming. And so right now when I identify that, Hey, this is a pocket I want to be taking running backs. I hope that lasts through the end of August, but um I want to be hammering it now. I want to be constructing teams that way now, as we just discussed. That's a great way to wrap it up. Don't be afraid to really hammer not just players, but structures that work for the given point in time. Those things will change. You may have a structure you like, and you're worried about getting too much exposure to right now. But if the best players to make that work evaporate later, you'll be frustrated that you don't actually have that exposure that you wanted when it's no longer as viable. So Ben, that was so much fun to go through some of your recent drafts, some of our recent research. I mentioned that uh, show with Pete there. That is Wednesday mornings and is also on Rotoviz Radio. You guys every week do fantastic work with ship chasing. That's must see basically TV, right? People are putting that up on their yeah. 80 inch yeah. screens. So Make sure you check that out. Colin Kelly and I, OT this week was an FFPC Superflex draft in their tournament. So that brings another whole range of decisions and tactical deliberations that you have to go through. We had a lot of fun with that. That's a fun, check. yeah, that's a great format to be to be considering and playing in right now, especially if you're getting tired of these wide receiver avalanches. Go, go play Superflex on FFPC. You'll be able to get some receiver values, I imagine. Definitely, definitely. That, I mean, that tournament, that tournament is a blast. So check us out those various places. As we mentioned, Ben released an article right before the show. Sign up for stealing signals, sign up for stealing lines. Join us over at Underdog using the code ROTOVIZ. And until we're back with you, keep drafting, everybody.